Thanks for coming. And uh, I, I don't remember if this is the first election that I've been through with the School of Architecture, but it's a it's a rather um, full uh, array of things to do tonight. So uh, for those of you who haven't yet voted, uh, I'm told that the polls are, are still open after the lecture. So you may want to just grab a glass of wine if you can downstairs and then uh, hide your, your closest polling place and, uh, and vote. It's an important thing. And it connects with our speaker as well, the notion of agency in the public realm. Uh, tonight is the third of uh, three Judith Seinfeld studios, which were dedicated to housing. Uh, this program arose in, I guess, four years ago in a series of conversations with Judith Seinfeld, who's the president of Heritage Management and a university trustee. Uh, and we were trying to think about a way that we could introduce students to the intersection between the marketplace and architecture, to begin to think about development and architecture and housing uh, in a series of studios. And we've, um, we've done that over the past three years. Each one of the housing studios is included in an exhibition, and I invite you all to the exhibition which follows um, Stanley Sadowitz's lecture tonight. And um, all three studios will be compiled as a publication uh, as part of a series that the School of Architecture uh, will be putting out over the next um, few years. So in the first year, you might, have, you might remember Julie Eisenberg of Koning Eisenberg looked at the potential here in Syracuse uh, for the reuse of um, older buildings. Uh, this one was in the case supply uh, warehouse on the west side. And the studio was taught collaboratively with Julia Cerniak. And the studio not only began to suggest other uses for artists' housing, uh, retail, mixed use, but also the ways in which the landscape might be reformed and there might be more creative thinking or alternative thinking about what a master plan means in a neighborhood that's as complex as the West Side. Last year, we were joined by Delavalle and Bernheimer, two very enterprising young architects who used as a site um, a high rise that they're doing just north of the Hudson Yards. And this was a great model for us of, of the ways in which architects can also begin to control uh, more thoroughly the means of production in getting uh, a building built, both in terms of new means of fabrication, but also looking at strategies for real estate development. A, a monograph on their work is forthcoming from Princeton Architectural Press that will make reference to the work done in Syracuse. And this year, of course, we have Stanley Sadowitz, and we're delighted that he could join us, coming from uh, San Francisco. And his project, unlike the first, which was about mat housing and a kind of reuse of a building, and unlike the high-rise uh, uh, project of the second studio, this third studio begins to choose multiple sites within the city of San Francisco and understands the possibilities at um, very difficult adjacencies within the city of San Francisco, where public spaces rub up against uh, residential districts. So I want to thank um, Judith Seinfeld for really having made this all possible. And it's a delight to see her. And I'd love to give Judy a round of applause. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Always fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I recently got an email uh, about an, an award which uh, a recent building of Stanley Sadowitz had gotten, and this was for the um, Beth Sholem uh, Temple in the Richmond, one of those kind of colorless sections, the non-topographically interesting sections of, of San Francisco. And uh, 
and I thought this was fantastic. It's a very powerful building, and I, and I expect that Stanley will show it. I wasn't surprised, however, because I always think about uh, Stanley's work as being remarkably resonant. And if anyone could begin to revive what's been a fairly tepid approach to ecclesiastical architecture in this current disenchanted age, it would be somebody like Stanley Sadowitz. It certainly recalls the work of Lou Kahn in the First Unitarian Church in its great <coughs> platonic power and its creative use of light. You feel both the pressure of architecture and also the release of the light at the edges of the building. But it also brought to mind one of Stanley's first buildings in 1978, a building for a house in the Transvaal in South Africa. What I found so striking about that building, and I, I'm sure you are familiar with this, it has a series of low arches, and it's close to the ground, and makes, it, makes use of, of a, a remarkably precise palette of, of uh, f materials that aren't normally associated with modern architecture. But what was striking is that while it didn't look either like the indigenous architecture, of South Africa or the colonial uh, artifacts of uh, the cultures that had inhabited that land, it seemed so remarkably situated, so sited within this difficult terrain of colonialism and indigenous populations. So Stanley's work has to do with architecture, memory, and meaning. We see this in his Holocaust Museum the, or the Holocaust Memorial in New England, located on a very difficult site, which is barely a glorified traffic island, you approach these lit rectangular columns of space and you somehow are isolated enough to stop for a moment in the midst of the city and to begin to think about occurrences very, very far away from Faneuil Hall where this is located. Stanley's work bridges scales from a, a project at the Wexner Center with three quarter inch plexiglass benches about display and archiving a library for a museum, or in his theater designs for Joe Good in San Francisco, or in his landscape projects, like those for the Raceway Park in Columbus, Indiana, a series of follies distributed through uh, the old uh, waterway that cut through the parkland, or the Battery Park City Esplanade, which makes a lit strand which parallels the Hudson down in Battery Park City. His attention to materials is exquisite, uh, recalling both an architectural patrimony and also the work of artists as diverse as uh, Richard Serra and other uh, minimalists like Donald Judd. In his Yerba Buena lofts, there's an, a, an approach which is both pragmatic and rigorous. His ability to use just two materials, concrete and channel glass, and to cleverly program this building for housing on a very deep site, burying the parking deep inside, and allowing the perimeter of the project to really be maisonettes, so that you could enter your apartment directly from the street or from the interior where you left your car at the third or the fourth level. And throughout, all of the buildings exhibit great intelligence, which Stanley is, is extended into competitions for public housing. His current work in Cleveland, also for housing and mixed use work. His remarkable collaboration with Alice Waters at Chez Panisse, looking at the relationship between food and culture and education. He's done a new center at Berkeley. And when uh, we were out in San Francisco last, and I think some of the students experienced this as well, we went to one of Stanley's restaurants, the newer ones, called Conduit. And you really get a sense of the pleasure in making space, but also the great pleasure of bringing people together in space the pleasure of lived experience. And so I'm delighted to have Stanley come and speak to us today. Stanley.
that's a hard act to follow. But, um, I, I call the um, talk Frameworks. Um, I'm interested in the unbundling of form and function, in producing space as frameworks of opportunity that provide freedom for the occupants. To realize this, I've searched for generators other than program. Sometimes I've thought of architecture like geography, pushed by forces like plate tectonics and geology, other times as mechanical systems, or metaphors that change things into what they are not. Sometimes I've made buildings like mathematical equations. Seven recurring ideas have developed over the years as the foundations of the work I'll show. The first is lenses. And this is actually the building that Mark was referring to, which oh, I forgot to switch that on. Well, I got a big boy. Each building begins with the site and the particular desires to transform it. Buildings are earth made of matter and a continuation of the geological processes that produce their sites, part of natural evolution. A building marks and amplifies its unique spot on the globe. Like a lens, it brings to focus and magnifies its particular time and place. The second idea is about the invisible. The essential medium of architecture is space, air, rather than substance, matter, which contains the emptiness. Architecture is the construction of charged voids, frames of opportunity, fields of possibility. I'm interested in space more than meaning, in the architecture of movement and flux, of time and event, rather than object and monument. I'm interested in the emptiness that material constructs. I'm interested in the invisible. The third idea is system. The generative ideas of modern architecture emerge from the consideration of buildings <coughs> as systems related to machines or natural organisms or the phenomena of the city. I'm interested in similarity and dissimilarity, in relations of relations, theme and variation, order and accommodation. I search for the highest common denominator to establish the field of operation as a framework of unity and a panorama of resistance. I'm interested in the art of math that deals with the logic of quantity, shape, and arrangement, in the study of patterns providing unifying generalizations for fields and subfields, in the science of structure, which enables focus on the <coughs> encompassing and comprehensive, the inclusive and the universal. The fourth is the idea of buildings as instruments. I'm interested in buildings as apparatus rather than object, <coughs> as instrument rather than monument. I think of architecture as support for human events, <clears throat> more like a camera than a photograph, more like a telephone than a conversation. I'm interested in generosity and opportunity rather than program and status. I've always resisted the idea of programming as authoritarian and aim instead for the generic and general. The purpose is to provide a clearing and opportunity for the unique and specific, to be determined indeterminately through the process of occupation. The aim simply is to construct freedom. The fifth recurring interest has to do with material. In the search for the authentic over the image, the actual materials and systems of assembly, the process of construction, becomes the aesthetic. I want to make objects that expose their cause, buildings that are perceptual process. I like to think of construction as growth, not an idealized form, but the actual performing of the work made precious. I think less about architecture as art and visual than architecture as cooking and haptic. I make buildings by the gathering and assembly of ingredients. The plan is the recipe. The sixth interest is time. Traditionally, architecture's tools encourage the description of the static or the very slow. We were unable to talk to ourselves about how buildings live in the river of time. We could not hold on to light and shadows. Built buildings teach the lessons of time, of their changing presence from day to night, and how they settle into their worlds. 
the reality of time's passage becomes a design element. And the seventh idea has to do with resources. Green architecture is not just about the future of building. We've developed both passive and active energy systems. These include intelligent design using solar orientation, shading, daylighting, window layers and sensors which calibrate and balance interior environments. We use renewable resources and build lightly using the least possible materials and effort to encompass the most possible volume and space. Our entire practice revolves around the idea of economy and optimization. After 30 years, the work proceeds along a series of parallel paths, exploring and refining a number of different types, houses, housing, schools, institutions, interiors, public landscapes, and religious structures. Unlike the 80s trajectory of each project, beginning with a clean slate, the process of evolution and distillation is our method. So I want to show you these groups of projects and how they follow these paths of thought, beginning with houses in landscapes. And in the early work, um, each project was really conceived from a blank slate as a new beginning. But towards the um, mid-80s, I began to realize that there were patterns in the work in landscape, which um, I began quite consciously to follow in a series of houses which all revolved around the idea of these bars which acted like cartography, describing their site through a single gesture, which um, sort of concretized the uniqueness of a particular spot. And so a whole series of houses were done based on this um, proposition. Um, beginning with this house, which is a pair of um, these bars, which, are, which are, is linked by a pavilion on a promontory. And here you see the organization of these two bars in this pavilion and the way that it um, is an emphatic redescription of its setting. Um, another example in a topography of three landscapes, a hill, a ravine, and a promontory, where three buildings are located on each of this, these geographies, linked by a porch and a bridge. And so you see the house as a kind of seam of these elements in the landscape. Um, another example of um, the idea of the bar house here, the bar now taking on a different um, concept where all the services are um, encrusted in this wall and then lead on to these series of open spaces. And this wall protects these um, dwelling areas from um, a road which is quite close by along the Silverado Trail in the Napa Valley. So here you see the sort of machine of the building and then the space beyond. And the machine and the penetration of that into the spaces. And the way that the building folds out into its landscape. Um, in the last few weeks, we've actually been working on an addition to this house, which is a small winery, where the same um, principles of this thickened wall now contain um, all the operations of making wine with an enclosed porch, which then ends up in a wine tasting room. And the building is actually made out of lagging, which is very much like the construction of barrels in the sort of typical way of doing retaining walls in this landscape. So this is the porch and the um, wines, the barrel storage behind glass and conditioned and then the production and uh, the presence in the landscape. Other houses based on um, these same sort of strategies here in a more suburban context, another bar house where the landscape is threaded um, entirely through the building, through this family area of the house. And here you see the sort of disappearance of the house through this bridge, which is actually where most of the life of the house occurs. And um, in a landscape above Petaluma, winding up a hill and then unwinding um, through the house into the landscape. And here the sort of, um, the sort of archetypal kind of bar house that uh, we did several of at this particular time um, with the... Uh, um, sort of um, 
program is arrayed in a series of floating elements through this mostly transparent object which um, barely interrupts the, the landscape and allows the sort of beauty of these rural sites to become pretty much the building itself. Another example in a more suburban setting where there was actually really no site. So the site itself is created with a landscape and an excavation for a car court and the construction of a small lake which partially is a swimming pool. And so this is um, the, the sort of making of the site in order to locate this bar in a particular terrain and the experience in the living room where you can slide open these doors and be inside of this lake. Um, in Marin, um, the bridge house, which um, is the same strategy of um, this placing of a single object in the landscape which redefines um, the landscape through its presence and again arranged in this um, format of the bar house. Here there's no actual flat terrain for exterior living so the house itself constructs it and there's two very distinct experiences which the house establishes. The one for the public part of the house which looks up to a large landscape and the other the private um, rooms of the house which look into a much more focused um, kind of compound formed by um, the trees. So this is the private part of the house and then the public part of the house which opens upwards and these um, outdoor areas which are actually constructed in the landscape because the landscape itself is barely habitable because of the slope. And um, again the view of um, these uh, public areas of the house or outdoor areas of the house, the entry, um, the arrival in the first um, court with the front door and an ex exterior fireplace um, and then um, into the public part of the bar and this flip-flop of two completely different experiences of the site constructed. The owners really fought with me about this idea and kept begging to have a window in their bedroom which I refused to do and now they're so delighted because they understand how um, different the two sort of realms the above and below of the house actually are. Um, this is the uh, walk to the pool and n not all my um, clients are as obedient. A lot of them fight much more t uh, tenaciously with me but these people were especially nice. Um, the walk to the pool and um, the, the pool house and outdoor kitchen and then the view of the bridge at night with the creek running through and the interiors um, and the fireplace which is also openable on the entry side so that you can be welcomed with a fire, the dining area which is focused on the creek and the bathroom and this theme of bridging and floating at all the scales of the building and uh, the view of the building at night. Other bar houses, um, this one not built for uh, one of the owners from 3Com who had had three wives and a large collection of children of different sort of generations which had to be kept apart. So these wings were a perfect solution to that. These were the first wife's children, the second wife's children, the current wife's children and then the kind of common areas. It's amazing the problems you have to solve with these, uh, this domestic architecture. This is another beautiful site. Um, uh, again, the house barely uh, a kind of interruption, mostly thought of as a frame, really, for a landscape, arriving in a large courtyard, and then um, a series of wings which branch out with the different program elements. And again, the sort of idea about architecture is really uh, attempting to dissolve itself and to be barely present. Um, and the interiors, the master bedroom which opens into a orangery. This is a house uh, for the drummer of Metallica but he hasn't been able to build it because he doesn't have enough money anymore <coughs> because of uh, the internet. But um, basically uh, it was an extremely ambitious project. Um, I think it was, I forgot how many, I, I know it was 20 million dollars. Um, and one of the things that I love was his garage. He has every model of Mercedes-Benz of the particular year. I mean, by now they're making more models, but he would collect them all, that's him. Um, and this was the house which 
um, focuses on Mount Tamil Pius. This is the master bedroom. But it was sort of another exercise in the bar houses. I'm just showing you the sort of playing out of this idea and um, the bathroom. And then the sort of latest bar houses here where two bars have been put together, creating a series of um, courtyards so that this in San Diego and every room is actually surrounded by outdoor space. So um, it's this kind of flip-flop of building and, and exterior. And each of them is allocated a different use. Um, this one is obviously the main living area with a pool coming in. This one is the prison for the children, which, um, <laughs> where you can protect them and, and let them be outdoors. And um, just the building again. And um, a current um, version of the bar house now wrapped around uh, a court um, in this kind of spiraling pattern with a series of pavilions linked by a trellis kind of roof. Um, and this um, sort of presence of a building inside this very beautiful um, sort of Northern Californian um, oak and, and manzanita um, treed area. He came to visit one day. Um, <laughs> This is uh, the last house, which is actually a house in Costa Rica, which is um, just getting finished. And it's, it's basically the same series of strategies. It's a house for people who live in San Francisco and, and basically use it as a vacation house. So it has to be secured and then can open up while they're there. And uh, it's again about a sort of interpretation of the forest and uh, its landscape. It's very, very rough. It's actually really nice to build in a different culture where it's so sort of rough and earthy as opposed to California. Um, the next group of houses... This stuff's not on the screen. Can I... Is there some way that it can... Uh, I guess I can manipulate it from here. Early houses. Can, can you put it on the screen? It'll be helpful for me. Just let's get the. The next group of projects are um, urban houses, and unlike the houses in the landscape, which are organised horizontally, these houses are actually stacked <laughs> vertically. And um, in the context of San Francisco, the higher you get, the better the views get. So typically. They're the inverse of the traditional house, where the most um, sort of important rooms are at the top, which creates this interesting problem of a journey up to get to those spaces. The other aspect of building in the city is that mostly we build these infill buildings with zero lot lines. So light penetration is a serious kind of concern. And so uh, strategies have been developed to... Um, carve out as much space to allow light to penetrate in a variety of ways. And these are the sort of exercises of these <coughs> houses. So um, I'll just show you quite quickly, but this is basically all exterior space and, and um, the, the sort of making of the outside as part of the building. Or here, um, another a strategy where the building is shaken loose from the party walls and you get these continuous kind of... Um, ways to aerate the interior on the edges. Um, a more conventional method of an interior courtyard. And um, in this case, the use of the stair as a way to sort of thread light down into the plan by this translucent uh, and reflective kind of object, which um, is both the path up to the public areas and the route down of light into the plan. And one of the sort of imperatives of building in San Francisco is the bay window, which we always um, include in our work. Um, and one of the sort of aspects of the city is that in the alleyways, the architecture is traditionally very flat, but it's always um, Victorian. And so one's always obliged to be contextual. In this case, we used uh, a technique of reflection with this etched glass 
to actually sort of um, become contextual. This is another bay window. Um, you can't sort of leave home without one in, in San Francisco or you won't be able to get it built. Um, so as long as you can tell people that you have a bay window, um, they're happy. And um, then some interior apartments. Um, here, uh, hollowing out of a space on the 14th floor of a high-rise where we were left with a lot of um, very awkward vertical chases for the apartments above and below. So basically, um, what we established were a series of combs which absorbed all of these things and clarified the space into three zones. This first area, which is a gallery for their art collection, all of the service zones, which are his bathroom, his dressing room, her bathroom, um, their kitchen, um, I don't know whose room that is, and that was his study, that they shared. And then their bedroom, and then the um, kind of cleared out master living area. So this is the sort of main space that's created out of the... It was a, uh, an apartment with, with many, many rooms. And these are the combs of space that compress all the program and create the clearing. And another um, house in the city here, a vertical core, again for an art collector where a kind of circuit of a gallery is created around the elevators and um, stairs and all the rooms unfold around that. So this is the sort of um, building and then the apartment with this gallery. And the use of art, like a Deborah Butterfield horse, as a room divider between the living room and the dining room and the kitchen and a Keith Herring man that anchors um, the back part of the house. So we actually allocated their whole collection in the house. Another bay window um, in one of the neighborhoods and um, a loft for an artist, an old Lucky Strike warehouse, which is now, which was then a garage which was then Cap Street, which is a famous um, art group that I, I actually designed their space for. So eventually this became a, a, a loft for a, a single artist and um, it basically needed um, rehabbing after the dot-com era when it had been really um, sort of devastated. So we cleaned it up and, and basically it's a very rough space. He's a, a recent graduate from the Art Institute. This is the kitchen. Um, and another view of the kitchen and the living room. So it's pretty much a series of set pieces. It's a 10,000 square foot um, loft. And it's one of our most successful projects because about six months after he moved in, um, he sent me an invitation to his wedding and I know the house had to do with it. I've been involved in divorces as well, but this one was <laughs> a really like, good one. So um, this uh, basically leads me on to the sort of um, key set of projects that we involved in, which are um, the multifamily urban housing that we've been doing. Um, I guess. This one. And I in this work, um, again, a series of general strategies have emerged. And... Um, Um, the one is always about building the urban context, of course, and about the way that the building is continuous with the fabric of the city. And I think this is an important kind of discussion today because so much of the architecture that gets celebrated these days are these kind of outer space sort of flying objects that are, you know, dumped. And I think there is room for unique and institutional work, which I'll show you later. But most of the sort of fabric of our cities is actually housing. And I think, you know, housing is um, responsible for um, kind of a continuation of the, the fabric of the city. And so um, it's been very important for us to deal with that aspect. The other thing about housing is that um, it's, it's um, one of the things that we need a quantity of quality of. And to achieve that we've resorted to the use of very rigorous and systematic approaches. Often you'll hear people showing off 
housing project and saying, are there not two units alike? Um, what's more important for me is that there's not one bad unit in a project and that every one of them has, um, you know, the, like qualities that, that balance it and make it a desirable home. And so the sort of lesson of mass production and repetition and the use of those techniques to improve quality becomes really important. So, you know, we don't want to have like um, 160 different kitchens. We like to have one kitchen or maybe two. And by doing that and repeating it, you can actually improve the quality of all the kitchens in a building. So these are just um, descriptions of this idea of the rigor of system. And um, another lesson from the kind of um, desirability of loft living which began in New York and the idea that people want actually to have the freedom to um, control their own spaces and not to be programmed into uh, a kind of condition where they have to live in a certain number of rooms. I mean, I, I lived in a Victorian when I first moved to San Francisco and it was actually like the most awkward way to live. It, you know, you couldn't fit a TV and a bed in the same room but it, and it was divided into all of these almost equal rooms. So, you know, the, the whole impetus of this housing is to compress all of the services to the most rigorous and economic um, single gesture, which then clears out all of the other space, which can be programmed simply by the use of furniture. So these are different examples of the same kind of proposition about housing where all the kitchens and bathrooms are stacked and incredibly clearly um, orchestrated so that again there's a search for economies and then also the freedom that's created in the other space which can be very likely kind of um, defined and reinterpreted <coughs> and these are other methods that the same sort of strategies approach so here you see the kind of program or the servant space or the service space and then um, the served space. And um, the other aspect of urban housing which I already mentioned is the problem of light penetration. And so in our housing there have been different strategies. One is to create these courts which actually fill buildings with deep light to orient the um, housing in a way that the optimum amount of light is achieved in the, the, unlike the sort of most typical um, format of um, urban housing which are these long deep units, you can also um, configure the, the arrangement in a way to produce these large um, exposures of light. And I'll show you the strategies that we've been developing to increase the surface area of windows. Um, other ways of creating light or in, through volumetric expansion where you have two-story spaces and it's possible for deep light penetration. So these are some of the examples of these projects. The first building was actually a building which um, I built as live-work um, housing and it's um, based on a basilica idea where there are these two zones of service where all the stairs and kitchens and bathrooms occur and then a free space in between which in section um, is a kind of scaffold where you can add and subtract these floor plates so you can fill in these zones if required or you can remove them but it's pretty much a system uh, as much as it is the building and it's also about a kind of reinterpretation of the traditional Victorian texture of the city this time using contemporary material but still trying to keep the same degree of um, information and this is actually the space which is our office and um, where you can see the sort of um, scaffold which is this basilica like structure and then the, the um, mezzanines which are placed within it and then the zones on the edges which are other bathrooms, kitchens, stairs, fire escapes or any other uh, sort of set element that's required or in this case a continuous table um, which is now used for drafting. These are very old pictures and it's a big mess of computers now and wires and why I want to move. Um, this is um, a building that we did um, almost 14 years later right next door which takes the same sort of approach but um, reinterprets <coughs> it in a much um, more refined language and so here you can see 
the entry to the unit, the large open space, the bedroom which is defined by a closet area, um, a fireplace, kitchen, and the bathroom split into three different zones all with sliding glass doors. And then um, the two required exit stairs which then give the opportunity for this large void of, um, um, of, of light well. Um, so here you see the sort of result of that spatial idea and the fact that um, this, which is only 700, uh, sorry, it's 970 square feet. This, uh, but it, it, it actually has a, uh, an appearance of a much more generous amount of space, both through the light and the kind of openness. And these are these sliding doors then, which um, contain all of the, in this case, storage, um, but also washer dryers. And here the bathroom, which is um, behind these doors. And one of the sort of interesting things about this system is that um, there's actually no mechanical or electrical or anything in this zone. Everything's contained in this area. So through this compression, there's a kind of economy that um, actually, again, can be translated into quality. So the saving on not having sprinklers everywhere, because the sprinklers are all along this one edge, gets put into having more glass, or, or some choice like that that we can make. So manipulating the resources is really important, because these kinds of problems are based on practice. And the, the sort of like poor quality of practice also sets the level that um, can be spent on these buildings. So these buildings have to be built for like under $200 a square foot or they don't pencil out and no one will do them. And so you have to trade the, the values and find ways to reallocate resources within that fixed budget. This is that courtyard and a view from the courtyard into one of the apartments and a view of the building down the street. We've done many of these buildings and are working on many. This is one across the street very similar um, layout, um, a different top unit, uh, another one around the corner, um, one on Fell Street and Pacific Avenue and Sada Street and Tehama Street. And um, one recently completed on Howard Street where a different um, sort of approach is used. One of the requirements of the zoning in this area is that 25% of the lot needs to be dedicated to open space. Typically it's placed at the rear of a building and you have light on two ends and stack three units. What we did here was transfer that um, as a slot right through the middle of the building, which then enabled us to provide light to the units all down the edges. And so this light well, which is a sort of rear yard now that benefits all of the units on each floor, uh, became an important part of the strategy. Um, this is just views of the light well and the way that it uh, operates with edge glass which provides a sort of layer of um, privacy and the entry decks into the units and um, the light well at night. Um, I mean it's been quite interesting to me because the making of this kind of common area has also produced a kind of community, like every month they show movies here um, and the whole building come. So, you know, it, it's something that I was always taught about at architecture school, but I've now actually seen that it's possible to do. This is um, the lobby area with these rocks, the mailboxes, and then um, the units which nest around this courtyard and the sort of use of um, simple materials but large amounts of windows and light and the, these floating service elements which create this kind of free plan condition um, and um, again the kind of uh, flexibility of the way that the interiors can be interpreta interpreted instead of having rooms and the sort of quality of the bathrooms which are these compact but reflective types of spaces and the rear of the building which faces north and um, is not shaded, but the um, south face has this um, electric louver system so that um, occupants can actually control the quality of light and also constantly transform the building so that it's a kind of living object in the city. 
On the top, we managed to do one of the units where we combined um, two of these bars. The one's the sort of living part, which is all black, and the other's the night part, which is all white. And so this is the entry, uh, this is the main entry, but this is the library or the courtyard, and then the living areas. And then um, the bridge across to the night areas, and the night areas all in this sort of um, white palette in the building at night. Yerbebuena Lofts was um, our first opportunity for a big urban building, and we wanted to take this kind of traditional context of the San Francisco Bay window and reinvigorate it at the new kind of scale of the way that we have to build cities today. We can't build them anymore in these little 25-foot pieces because the economies and the demands um, make it essential to work at these bigger scales. But we wanted to keep um, a lot of the character and texture. So uh, Mark mentioned this idea of the parking buried in the middle of the building where you can go directly to your unit, but also that the building exterior doesn't have any exposed parking and is all live edges. And again, the kind of rigor of these um, lots as, as sort of lofts, which are, are treated much more like free space. The attempt to use the kind of texture of San Francisco's bay windows and the repetitive textured uh, facades of the city in a new scale and the stepping down of the building as it comes to the lower level of a, a 40 foot height zone off a boulevard where there's an 85 foot height zone. So this is the smaller scale of the building um, on this, uh, the, the rear part and this is the kind of traditional texture of the city. So you can see the kind of reflection and um, the use of this um, system of uh, a basic um, 16 by 16 um, egg crate which contains a house and the flip-flopping of um, the translucent channel glass with the clear glass that creates the variety and richness of, of the pattern. And one of the, again, um, aspects of this building, apart from capturing all these sort of images of San Francisco in a new way, um, was the actual method that allowed this building to be competitive in the marketplace. So in a typical um, building of this type, the concrete frame is a kind of um, skeleton which is entirely wrapped by um, a whole series of processes which actually require seven trades to complete the waterproofing of the building. In this case, um, what we did was use the concrete as a, a finished product and then have only one trade which is um, glazing, um, come and um, after the glazing was set, um, basically the building was waterproofed and the interior completion could proceed, which speeded up the process and which allowed us again to translate some of the costs into value by, instead of just having little windows, which would be typical in these buildings, these entire surfaces as, as they meet the um, exterior, of glass. This is the lobby and again you can see just the raw construction as the kind of product and expression of the building. I mean this is a structural slab which has actually just been saw cut and stained. So everything is sort of the production of the building which then is its uh, product. And the, uh, a small lobby on the rear and the um, sort of streets that um, lead to the units themselves and very like inexpensive ways to try to produce quality. This is um, some of the unit plans. There's quite a variety of different units. And the way the units were delivered, where there was a marketing center where selections could be made to customize and personalize the units. So basically you bought a raw shell and then you could choose floors, light fixtures, um, window coverings and so on to make it um, personal and unique. And so every unit does end up different, even though you know, it starts with this systematic and rigorous... All the kitchens, for example, are the same, or all the bathrooms. It's just in the finer finishes that people are able to customize and, and change their units. 
Um, this building led on to many others, and I just want to show them to you because it's a kind of continued idea. This is a building in Mexico City on a really amazing site where there's an 80 foot drop off. And so you enter at one level, there's this lobby common area which has a view of the city, and then um, the same type of units with this compacted service zone and free space and um, the type of unit. In Sacramento, mixed-use building with office, commercial, and a variety of housing, some lofts, some um, one-story houses, um, arranged around a courtyard. And um, again, like here, starting to look at other types of units, like this is a, a townhouse with an interior stair where you have a one-bedroom. There are other versions where there's two-bedroom, and so on. So within this framework, trying to create a variety of different houses and all based on the same system where within this zone there's a, a, a vertical distribution area. This is a dropped soffit where um, all of the mechanical systems are pumped into a clear area where there's no service and so this sort of economy and rationalization of the mechanisms produces both a free space and a sort of very simple way to do things. This is a 100 unit project in Emeryville, also based on the same principles. And um, another uh, project in um, the uh, Russian Hill area of San Francisco, here a slightly different variant where um, there's a deeper kind of service bar. These are more luxury houses, you can see they're quite extensive. Um, but the same sort of strategy, this is the vertical distribution core, with elevators and stairs, then all the service bars. And so as you go up the building, the units change, but they always um, chase through the same um, zone. So these are different kind of plan configurations um, of a small two bedroom or a luxurious two bedroom. And just a sort of, well, there's a view of one of the units where you come in and there's a kitchen, open kitchen, a little study area, and then kitchens and bathrooms a bedroom with sliding doors behind that and another bedroom on the other end. Um, behind the city hall on Fulton Street, another example of this with a large grocery store and then um, uh, again trying to reinterpret this traditional texture, in this case using a curtain wall system of um, different types of glazing. I mean here there's even another proposition which is that you only have one trade actually responsible for the wrapping of the building and so um, it's, it, 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 it's, it's another attempt to try and rationalize the, the system and um, I mean you can see the same sort of unit types back to back um, and a variety I mean these can be sliced off in different sizes and so on but the, the sort of simple strategy of, of how the housing is produced with this light court in the middle and a grocery store down at the lower level and this same uh, unit type and this idea of the sort of San Francisco skin of a uh, curtain wall bay window skin. A high rise in, um, in um, San Jose using um, the same strategy, a sort of interesting combination of a church who owns the land and a developer who's going to build on top of the church. So the lower level is this program of church space and then on top of that this um, high-rise tower. So this is the main street of the church which contains the worship space and a common area and then um, above that the housing which um, is the same unit again. Um, and another high-rise at Jack London Square in um, Oakland where um, the city was interested in a kind of signature building that would really demarcate this um, sort of second city of the Bay Area. And so they encouraged um, a, a design which would be quite memorable. And um, it's basically um, the same kind of unit plans that you've seen nested around a core um, which have these carve-out gardens and um, basically this um, continuous sort of base which is at the scale of the city out of which this tower falls into the sky. 
and the rooftop, which is a, a common area swimming pool podium in the view of now. Another housing type, this is a sort of reinterpretation again of the bay window, um, where as you move around, the building becomes more transparent. So you, you see here um, the way that it opens to the views. And this is a unit where um, basically in 800 square foot, we have a two bedroom house with these sliding doors which divide these two bedrooms off. So this is the unit with the kitchen and behind that the bathroom and storage and then sliding doors where you can basically close off the bedroom or have a completely open circuit and um, a cafe down below and another building using the same sort of strategy of taking the rear yard and splitting it into three small rear yards so that you again compound the potential of light and then the same unit type that um, gets um, stuck in the middle of that and allows this um, sort of world of flexibility. Another of these buildings, a lot of these are not going to get built because of the um, conditions of the market, but or maybe will, I don't know. Another one where, again, we've tried to take the rear yard and extend it to have um, the optimum amount of um, girth so that th uh, the most amount of light penetration is possible into the interior and the sort of quality of the interior units. Uh, and um, these are other projects that are older and I won't go into them now, but I will show you this one, um, which is in Sacramento, which is a townhouse project of four different townhouse types, which um, use a similar strategy. Instead of taking uh, the traditional way of making townhouses, which is a building and a yard, the exterior space is threaded in a sort of more um, integrated way. So uh, there's a series of different gestures like this zigzag with another zigzag on top of it which creates these courtyards or here an E with an L um, and um, or, or um, these other types where um, each room actually then uh, is uh, afforded a kind of outdoor space which is threaded through the building instead of just a back and a front. And on um, the Octavia Gateway, another attempt to reinterpret the texture of San Francisco. Here, the traditional rear yards which you see at this scale of the city are threaded into this building at a smaller scale so that every home is actually um, nested around a yard and basically um, these gardens then are these vertical gardens which we've been seeing a lot of which connect people to the seasons and um, change through time and so um, basically they provide that sort of link. It's also on a boulevard with uh, extensive amount of traffic and so um, what we tried to do was look at the kind of traditional Victorian texture which is this sort of vertical configuration and then find another way to um, recreate it with these moving shutters which each house controls and so it's a, a kind of west facing version of the Howard Street project that um, I showed you before where now the louvers are vertical and but again they allow this um, response and transformation these are just the public areas and the units the same unit that you've seen before and a two bedroom version of that where the service bars back to back and then a master suite, a second bedroom, and then a living room, which is um, around the, the yard. So this is just the sort of condition of that building. And just two blocks away um, is this building, which is a kind of flat iron site in San Francisco. And um, here, uh, again, um, the unit types that you've seen, um, another version of it on the edge, but uh, a kind of solar uh, treatment that thickens the facade. And um, another building on Pine Street, um, using again the same plan forms. Um, very small housing um, in the Castro area, just tiny little efficiency units where you enter, there's a shower, a toilet, and a sink, and then a kitchen and an open room. Um, in Cleveland, 
um, a combination of student housing and market rate housing at the um, entrance to Case University. So these are the two buildings that we're working on. Office Star are doing two buildings here. This is FOA, who are doing MOCA, and then Winnie Moss, who's doing an addition to this building, which will be the CIA. Um, our project's actually going ahead, and we're in design <coughs> development right now, um, because the financing is available for the housing, but I think some of the other things are probably going to be quite slow in um, realizing. But these, these are um, student housing, and then across the street, um, there's this building which has a Barnes & Noble bookstore um, and a, a, a CVS um, cafe. And this is one of the market rate houses where we've introduced a courtyard into this plan. There's also a, a townhouse versions, but this is the quality of that house with um, basically the master bedroom, a courtyard, and then the big living area. And um, for the CCA campus um, in San Francisco, another student housing project, um, this is basically um, market rate um, student housing. It's being developed um, by a private developer who is in contract with CCA who will lease the entire building and then rent the apartments to their students. And the goal has been to provide a bed for $1,000 a month. So it's a fairly... Um, lean project. Um, it's basically based on the same strategies. Um, these are the three different unit types. R the richest kids can have one of these. The others have to share two bedrooms. And these are actually going to probably be three um, students per um, room. But each of them has a kitchen, a bathroom, and the unwashed dryers. And um, these are the common areas which are on every floor, which is a communal kitchen area, little TV, and then actually, yeah, we, we, we don't have, we have common washer dryers. And this is another example of a, a kind of solar um, treatment of the skin where basically um, the building is northwest facing and one of the really difficult conditions in San Francisco is the western summer sun. So there's a series of shading which also orient the views to downtown and really spectacular kind of um, moments in the city. And so this is um, basically the, the um, way that the building will be experienced is t changing from very transparent to pretty solid. These housing projects actually are quite um, long in, in coming. And um, so what we've started engaging in is um, a lot of... Uh, interiors which sort of compensate because they're projects that happen really rapidly and um, they, they're really rewarding because um, you know you, you get them built fast and they fund them and um, so um, there's a series of sort of approaches that we've developed for these which have to do with trying to create a branding with the design so in this case a bar called Horizon where there's a horizon light or Conduit, where the name of the restaurant actually emerges from the design, or Joe and Eddie's, which is sort of Italian family style, or Misu, which is a spa all about water. So this is Conduit, and um, this was a, a found space in a newly constructed building where um, there's housing above, and it's a really lousy room, and this was actually all existing. And so when I first went there, I really was sort of confounded by it and didn't know what I was going to do. But um, eventually um, I decided to add more conduit rather than try to mitigate it and to sort of turn what was, you know, like a really unfortunate problem into the, the kind of prospect of the, the restaurant. So, um, you know, the, the, the restaurant took its name from the design and um, it's, it's sort of got a lot of... Um, laughs and you know and it, it's actually quite a fun place Mark mentioned it but you know the conduit um, confounded the electrical inspector who was really <laughs> like unwilling to sign off for a while because she didn't know where there were wires but um, eventually we, we explained that any of the conduit that's cut off doesn't have wire and so she was <laughs> but um, there's a uh, 
these uh, copper coated, um, powder coated paint um, versions, which uh, present the sort of hot and cold water aspect of the of the conduits, and then regular galvanized conduit. And um, anyway, this is the wine uh, room, the cellar, and also private dining area, and the bathrooms, which have this sort of continuous sink and um, these etched glass uh, doors. These are other restaurants which, this is a, a Horizon, which is a bar, which was a really awkward space, so uh, where a series of um, lives had occurred before. It was once Vanessi's restaurant, if, if you know, it's a, what is a classic. But anyway, the whole area changed and now it's a kind of dive bar, but we tied it all together with darkness and this one strip of light. And um, so this is uh, a spa called Misu, where the theme is about water. And um, so uh, these are um, drapes which are actually behind um, the air handling so that they're constantly shimmering. These are rocks. And the rest is a kind of prosthetic device for um, being um, pampered, you know, with uh, pedicure and manicure, which I never had until... I did this place, and now I'm, I'm quite hooked, actually. <laughs> I go, if, 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 you know, with any excuse. I've also done my doctor's office, which I don't like to go to. But um, anyway, this is the sort of process and the devices for doing it. And um, this is a, a tanning and, and a hair salon next door, which um, we found this three-form product which looked like hair that, you know, when you go to the barber shop, there's always <laughs> hair on the floor. And it, I thought if we use that, it'll never look dirty and ugly. And so the whole place is so hairy. And, and you know, you can drop anything on the floor and it doesn't matter. And then behind, there are these bizarre sort of tanning machines where you get sprayed with oil and put in a rotisserie. Which I don't do that. <laughs> And um, so this is, this, these are the, this weird light that comes out of these tanning machines. And then these are a series of optical stores where we designed a kind of package. Um, and um, we built four of them. They basically deal with a lot of glass and, and glasses. And um, th th there's just a palette of material and a sort of series of ways of displaying the glass and where the opticians sit and this idea of this... Um, black slate which wraps up and so this is the one of them and then this is another one and we've done um, a third now and um, this is a new restaurant that we're working on in the Fillmore called Mississippi and it's obviously southern food and I was interested in the Mississippi and decided to make one table in the whole restaurant so it would be like very family like you know eating your fried chicken like in a big crowd and um, but the, the owners insisted that I have these tables that you could remove, so it wasn't one table. But, you know, you can fill it in as one continuous table. And then it's also about jazz. It's in this new jazz district, so this is kind of like a musical instrument that hangs over, that has light inside it. And that's the Mississippi. And then um, this is a restaurant called Toast, which um, we started to do a kind of a deconstruction of Toast. And... Um, toast is a sort of interesting name for a restaurant because it, it says breakfast, lunch and dinner and toast is like, you know, like this and also like this and actually yeast is the cause. So um, uh, anyway, it's, you know, it's like walking inside a loaf of bread or like <laughs> being in a glass of champagne. It's this completely bubbly environment that's made out of particle board and um, it's kind of, you know, this is the seating area, restrooms, and then the whole kitchen thing. It's actually in a shopping mall, but um, it's under construction. It's going to open in January. And um, this is being milled um, with, uh, you know, like, or with a routing machine. It's actually been really fun uh, working on this. There's um, just two other projects that I want to show you. One is the Tampa Museum of Art. And I have to find that. Um, and then the other one is um, the synagogue. And so the Tampa Museum is in here. 
it's actually um, having its topping out on Friday, and so it's it's pretty exciting. <coughs> it's it's been a really like great project because um, it's gone so sort of smoothly, uh, so unusually smoothly for us. We started it uh, less than the, uh, well, like maybe 18 months ago and it's already um, built. It's in um, the downtown of Tampa where there's an attempt to sort of rebuild the, uh, the kind of inner city. It's a really, really suburban um, condition. And so one of the issues of the site is that it's in a floodplain. So none of the um, working part of the museum could be in this first 18 foot, which is all the 100 year flood area. The other sort of interesting thing about museums, which was a surprise to me, is that two thirds of the program actually is about administration. And only one third is for public display. It's amazing how the bureaucracies in um, the world have taken over. But that's a fact about how museum programs work. So um, basically the building's arranged as two buildings joined together. One is about the public and display organized around this vertical court which the galleries rotate around. And then the working areas which are arranged around another courtyard uh, and bring light into it. And these are the programs as you go up. And um, the, this is the museum in the park. Um, this is this 18-foot um, flood plan, and this is a 40-foot cantilever with, um, because the two pro cause you, you didn't have much program f that could be exposed to the flood. And the building, um, as you sort of see it in its various contexts. And the idea of the skin is pretty much um, about a reflection of um, the sky or the water and this kind of shivering and um, constantly changing element which um, is made out of these two layers of perforated metal which create these moray patterns as you move around it. And um, between them is fiber optic light so that the entire um, surface actually also becomes a billboard and will be an artwork um, at night. And um, so this is um, the, the sort of experience of the museum coming into the main lobby which is open on both sides, um, ascending to the galleries and um, then um, the gallery spaces which are these very kind of neutral frames for a variety of art, a glass collection which they have of that sort of weird looking stuff. Um, this, this is um, the work area which is around this courtyard <coughs> the structure, which have these massive um, trusses which cantilever off these um, concrete cores. And then um, the ceilings where we've worked hard to uh, create a kind of ambience and quietness, which is a problem in museums because light is so demanding. But um, all the light will be recessed above the ceiling. Um, and then just a model and um, the kind of um, construction as it was um, like a few weeks ago, but the roof's now completed. And this massive cantilever, the, these columns are just temporary. Now, th they were actually removed um, yesterday. And um, so now, not this one, sorry, the, these ones. Um, so this whole area now is sort of floating out into the park. And these are the <coughs> cores that support that. Um, so the last... Um, projects have to do with um, Hebraic architecture and um, it's a very sort of complicated subject because basically the Jews don't have any tradition in architecture so doing synagogues is quite difficult and um, I realized uh, quite a while ago that um, when, my, when Abraham went to Egypt um, he saw all this amazing stuff and then he returned to um, Israel and he lived in this tent and somehow he was content about not having this amazing sort of material splendor. And the truth is that the way the Jewish religion has sustained itself is not through objects but through text and it's actually through 
um, the word. And um, so there's a really beautiful um, statement that um, Abraham Heschel made where he said, for the Jews, the, the Sabbaths are our great cathedrals. Uh, Jewish tradition exists in time rather than in space. And it's marked through the um, celebrations of the Sabbath every week and all of the holidays. And this is the way that this religion, which has lasted actually a, an extraordinarily long time, has sustained itself and not through material. So, you know, like where it leaves the architect a bit sort of lost. So um, there, there were some um, sort of moments to track back to, to find the origin of Hebraic architecture. And one of the most interesting is the tabernacle, which um, after the Jews were expelled from or escaped from Egypt or whatever happened. Um, <laughs> well, I, t I just saw it in the movie. But... <laughs> Moses, Moses went up and he got those tablets and then when he came back the Jews had made this um, golden calf and you know he broke the tablets and then he went back and when he went back God gave him the specifications for this tabernacle which was to be a symbol of the place where God dwelled. It was actually the first idea of like a, a sacred space. And what's amazing about the description of the tabernacle is that all of the discussion about it has to do with the connection of the pieces that made it up. And very little is actually said. You can read it all in Exodus. Very little is said about the material, the thing itself. So that the building, in a sense, is a metaphor for the community that it joined through um, this kind of like assembly and disassembly of this object, um, you know, as they moved through the desert. When the Jews finally settled in Jerusalem, they actually built this temple. And in many ways, it's modeled on Egyptian architecture, but there's really, really interesting and significant differences. And they have to do with the ideas that were behind it. This is a stair to... Um, the, an altar where the priests would climb. And when they climbed the stair, they would sing a song, which was the song of ascent, Sheha Ma'alot. And as they sang the song, which had an irregular rhythm, through their voices, they were connected to the staircase in the building, so that through their song, they were actually like cemented to the architecture. There are many other aspects of this in its descriptions that have that same idea of a building that has more to do with ceremony than with objecthood. For example, these courtyards are described as there where the space was biggest, there was its greatest use. When the temple itself was built, it was built in silence, it's told. And no tools of iron or um, any sort of violent noise was permitted in the construction of the temple. So this amazing building, God's house, actually grew in silence. So it was these kind of ideas that really sort of interested me. And finally, the sort of most sacred space of the Jews, which is this not very well-built western wall in Jerusalem, which is one of the walls of the temple that remains, which is now the heart of like Jewish life. So, uh, you know, out of this I started to try to develop a way of making objects for Judaism, and the first one that I made was this um, menorah, which is for the festival of, of Hanukkah, which is coming up pretty soon. And the, the, the sort of, um, the, the story about Hanukkah is that there was only a little oil in it, but it burned for eight nights. So each night you light a candle, starting here, and then you light it with this candle. And then the next night you light two, and then you light it with this candle. So what I tried to do in this object was actually just capture the ceremony of how um, this candle lighting occurs and also to provide a trace for the idea of the candle. And so this is this um, object which, which sort of describes the ceremony. Um, we've done two synagogues. Um, the first is this one in La Jolla, which was an addition to an existing building. And um, basically... 
um, a very complicated hillside uh, with you know, a lot of difficulty of older people getting to the synagogue. And so there's um, all kinds of devices that had to be invented. But um, the concept is really about um, a kind of menorah in a certain sense that's um, a wrapping of light that protects a sanctuary within. And the sanctuary is in a quite traditional and conventional format where there's a, there's a main level and then a gallery up above. And um, basically, um, this is a sort of view of this wrapping of light. And you can see, like, there's actually a variation on the north and the south to try to balance light for this inner sanctuary, which is sort of held inside of the light. And here's a, a view of the building. And uh, the, um, this is a marriage chapel in front, a chuppah. And then um, the building, which is made out of these... Um, precast concrete elements which are the color of Jerusalem stone, these kind of um, devices which protect the interior and bounce light. And the interior, the forecourt, um, with all kinds of ritual um, objects. And then the actual sanctuary itself, which is in the format of old European synagogues where um, the gallery was actually traditionally reserved for women worshippers who weren't allowed to participate in the main ceremonies of the service which happened below. And even though this is a conservative synagogue where that's no longer the case, they wanted this format, which um, the other synagogue um, that I'm going to show you does not have. So this, they're both part of the conservative movement, but this one's a much more conservative group than the group in San Francisco. And um, so in the San Francisco synagogue, the first instruction was to try to eliminate this um, heritage of the separation of men and women and to create a kind of more egalitarian space. And that was actually what was the impetus for this bowl, where um, everyone is sort of in the same condition around the um, bimmer in the center, which is where the services are conducted from. And um, this is a view of it at night. This is the site which is along Park Presidio, which, um, as Mark mentioned, is in the Richmond, which is this very flat and sort of like in San Francisco part of the city. This is just to show you very quickly the organization. You arrive in a courtyard, you go up a stair, and um, these are mostly the... Um, more support functions of the synagogue, the administrative areas, the private offices, a small garden, a courtyard, an existing <coughs> school which is connected, a library, meeting rooms, restrooms, elevator, a kitchen, and then uh, a daily chapel, which I'll show you, and other meeting rooms. So this is the, uh, the actual s processional ceremony where you come in, you go up the stair, you come into this courtyard, turn around and face east to actually um, enter the synagogue and have the Torahs on the east, which is a very important part of the liturgy. And actually one of the reasons why this project started at all was because the old synagogue that had been built here, you enter directly off the street and face the wrong way. Um, this is just a view of the sort of um, base of the synagogue where... Um, all the support activities happen, and then the two big gathering spaces, the sanctuary and uh, the social hall. So these are views of the early model, but it shows you the sort of procession. And um, this is the building itself. So you arrive, you enter um, this first courtyard, um, let's see, which is here. You go up the stair, arrive here. And so it's about this sequence of transition from the city to a sacred space, um, coming up the stair and then um, looking back at the city and then arriving and entering the sanctuary from this point. Um, and um, one of the, so this is the entry into the sanctuary. Like one of the kind of interesting and complicated things about uh, Jewish space is that um, images are forbidden. There are very few images that exist in Jewish literature. There's no like figuration. 
and the only things are the Star of David and the menorah. And um, images are equated with idolatry. So you can't really have images. And so what I did here was use light to make a menorah, which um, is cast from these beams onto the wall. This is another shaft of light, which is what's known as the eternal light, which is what lights the Torahs. But um, here you sit and through the day, you get this experience of this menorah, which sort of moves around the space and comes and goes. And um, so that the ornament is actually through light. The other aspect of the building is that um, there's actually no views out of the sanctuary itself. Like, um, I'm going to just go back a minute. Um, one of the uh, sort of discussions that I had with the rabbi was how to create a sense of sacred space. And I realized that um, in the city, like the only original and sacred part of creation is the sky. So the only views out of this space are actually of the sky, which is the sort of last thing that's intact, that hasn't been transformed through the works of man and where you can still have an experience like you can, say, in nature, where you feel like, you know, this awesome sense of creation. So um, this is the room at night where the ceiling becomes lit like a starry sky. And the other spaces, um, the sanctuary, there was a synagogue which we demolished on the site, and it had these very ugly stained glass windows, which also are not really um, part of Jewish tradition, but a lot of the families who had given them were still members, so we took them and sort of, um, they had arches which we took away, and then we put them all together and intensified them as this sort of tattooed surface. This is the um, administrative area and the meditation room. This rabbi is also part of Buddhism traditions and he teaches meditation and a meditation garden that's part of the um, clergy offices in, the, in this meditation room. And the courtyard sort of leaving and then the main courtyard with this um, multi-purpose room which is um, for weddings and so on in the building in, in its context. The last project I wanted to end with is the New England Holocaust Memorial, which <coughs> is one of the, it's the oldest project that I'm showing. It was won in a competition in the early 90s. And um, it's um, on the Freedom Trail in um, Boston, right across from Boston City Hall, Faneuil Hall, Quincy Market, and all that stuff. And um, so it was a project which had a lot of, um, um, responsibility both to a context where it had to somehow fit and dis discuss and, and dialogue with the surroundings uh, and also at a more intimate level um, become part of this little sliver of ground which was sort of a park and then at the most direct level teach about the Holocaust and act as a kind of reminder of this incredible tragic um, moment in our history. So the memorial itself is comprised of these um, six glass towers which are named after the six death camps that were um, created in Poland which were the sort of factories where the final solution was actually um, carried out. And an incredibly sinister proposition of making factories whose product was death. And of all the sort of difficulty of the Holocaust, this was the one thing that I latched onto as the most sinister and sort of hard to believe moment. And so these are um, each named after one of those camps. And then as you walk through the towers, each tower has a small narrative of a survivor describing a moment in their, in their life in the camp. And below each tower is a pit in which the name of the camp um, is in a kind of smoldering condition. And um, on the towers themselves, are a, a million numbers are etched on each tower to represent or provide a ledger for the six million that were reportedly um, murdered. And as you walk through these towers, you become tattooed 
with the shadows of these numbers. So you, in a sense, become trapped in a, a kind of theater of despair <coughs> as a remembrance of this very, very dark moment in the history of humanity. And from the towers, warm air, which is the temperature of human breath, rises up um, through these um, chimneys as a, a kind of moment of, of memory. And at night, uh, the towers are lit from the outside so that it's a similar kind of experience. And these are the names of the um, camps that are incised um, in the pits below the towers. And these are the towers which, as well as presenting this tragedy, are also emblems of hope and aspiration because um, the fact is that um, we survived to actually build this memorial and to um, continue to teach people about the, the dangers of, of, of this kind of evil. So it's also about a hope and aspiration, which is what towers stand for. Thank you.